SVP is a disaster recovery and resilience nonprofit working to shrink the time between disaster and recovery. And as part of that goal, we've partnered with the Walmart Foundation to present webinars focused on educating disaster recovery leaders to fortify people against unnecessary suffering. SVP has five interventions, building efficiently, sharing our model with other organizations, preparing home and business owners through resilience training, advising municipal and state officials and advocating for policy changes and improvements to the disaster recovery industry. We believe in a holistic approach to disasters, increasing resilience before and streamlining recovery after. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to our senior govern government advisor, J.R. Sanderson. Well, good morning, folks. Today, we're going to have a great uh, pitch uh, by our friend and colleague, uh, Joe Boyce, on all things associated with HUD proofing. Uh, but before we get to that, just a couple of things that we'd like to talk to you about in terms of SVP. Uh, January 9th through the 12th in Savannah, Georgia, uh, we will provide the leader practitioner course. This, of course, is funded by the Walmart Foundation. Um, if you would like to uh, join us at this, we can guarantee you that you will have not only a good time, but you will learn a tremendous amount, not only from the cadre that we'll bring, but also from your peers about all things CDVGDR and CDVG MIT related. So with that, let's go to the next chart. And here I'd also like to advertise um, that we are going to, uh, based upon demand, based upon demand from uh, numerous grantees, we're going to hold our finance for effect course. Um, this is how uh, finances are absolutely critical in everything that we do in CDBGDR and CD, CDBG MIT. And uh, this is a course that we held last year to great review, and we're going to hold it again this year. We're going to do it in Savannah. Um, we're going to do it from the 6th to the 8th. Uh, it is two days. This is not paid for by the Walmart Foundation, so we are having to charge for this course. Um, it will be $2,200 per seat, but I can uh, guarantee you that you will walk away from this with uh, a far, far greater understanding and proficiency in all things finance associated with, uh, with this business that we're in. Let's go to the next chart, please. Um, here are our upcoming webinars. Uh, as you can see, we've planned out for the entire uh, next year. Um, in November and December, we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about leadership and decision making and organizational effectiveness. Uh, January, we'll pick up again with uh, with some good good talks about recovery strategy, how to do that. Uh, March is going to be exceptional because we've uh, we're going to contract for some really really smart environmental folks to come on and talk to you. Uh, and as you can see here, we just continue out throughout the entire year uh, talking about uh, these critical topics in disaster recovery. Next chart, please. And folks, we ask that you follow us on LinkedIn, right? So uh, we ask people to uh, to follow the SBP link. Uh, we do put on a great deal of information up there, uh, and we think it helps the disaster recovery community. Next chart, please. And with that, uh, I get the great honor of introducing uh, Joe Boys. Uh, Joe is the Director of Business Development Partnerships here at SBP, part of our great advice team. Uh, Joe has planned and executed uh, 2015, 2016, and 2018 South Carolina hurricane disasters. Uh, he is the author of uh, various action plans that you've seen written uh, that come from the great and sovereign state of South Carolina um, and candidly probably has the highest disaster IQ of anybody I know. Uh, he's got more than 10 years of experience and of course he he holds uh, and lords that masters of public administration over us from the University of South Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, now my pleasure to introduce to you Joe Boyce. Thank you, sir. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> next slide. So uh, what all we're going to talk about here today is basically it sets the foundation for ensuring that you have at the end of the day, a successful program. So you see compliance, finance and auditing really uh, are, are the frame of what a successful program needs to look like. So we're going to focus on that to HUD proof our programs. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of different ways that you can improve your programs to ensure that uh, you don't run into any issues whenever you have a monitoring visit from HUD or the OIG. But at the end of the day, when HUD comes to talk to you, they're really gonna focus on three major areas. They're gonna take a look at your eligibility requirements. Did you do what you said you were going to do in your action plan and only serve folks who met your eligibility requirements? They're gonna look at your procurement processes. Uh, what, did you follow the law, whether it's yours or the federal requirements, whichever is more stringent? And then they're going to take a look at duplication of benefits. 
uh, with CDBGDR funding really being the funding of last resort, there's a lot of funding that came prior that you have to account for before you try to serve anyone within your program. And they're really gonna put that under a microscope whenever they're taking a look at the program. Next slide, please. So the first way we can HUD proof is by following the law. Uh, obviously knowing which laws apply is going to be critical. Um, and there are a number of laws that do apply to these programs. Fortunately for us, HUD has put out a lot of resources so that you know the regulations and the standards. And if you have not already dived into it, I would encourage you to take a look at the CPT monitoring handbook, particularly focusing on chapter six, which deals directly with disaster recovery. Everyone in your organization needs to be familiar with these laws. And then you need to clearly articulate in your action plan how you intend to follow all the federal requirements. Next slide, please. <clears throat> really, really huge. Can't emphasize enough. Your initial procurement and purchasing needs to be as clean as possible and you have to make sure that you follow the law. Closely avoid any conflicts of interest or the appearance of a conflict of interest. And as I mentioned. You need to follow your procurement law or the federal standard, whichever is more stringent. A lot of folks had to repay a lot of money based on shoddy procurements. So don't take shortcuts and make sure that you're doing things by the book. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the federal register is going to establish the framework in which you develop your programs and activities. You have to know what is in that federal register notice. Everyone in your organization has to be familiar with it. And then once again, your action plan is where you're going to articulate how you meet those requirements established in the federal register notice. Next slide, please. That action plan, once again, everyone in your organization has to be familiar with it. And if you put it in your plan, make sure that you're doing it and then make sure that you're documenting how you did it, hopefully in a robust, comprehensive system of record, not using paper files. Next slide, please. That system of record has to have everything. If it's not in the system, it didn't happen. Documentation 100% beats conversation. Um, if you have a conversation, make sure you document it, whether that's through a memo, but attach it to the case file. Next slide. So your system of record needs to be comprehensive. It should follow your clients from initial outreach all the way to file closure. It needs to be as transparent as possible. Um, it needs to be user friendly. HUD should be able to show up and look at a case file without you providing any direction and be able to follow that from outreach all the way to the end of construction and the closure, closure of that file. Um, the, the simpler and easier to use your system is, the more success you're going to have, the less time you're going to spend training HUD staff whenever they come to conduct a monitoring visit. Um, the more likely you are to have a positive outcome seven, eight, nine years down the road if OIG decides to come in and, and dig into your files, because more than likely the folks who were working on the file at the time probably won't be with your organization anymore. So that system of record needs to be able to tell your story from beginning to end. Next slide. The greatest way to have credibility is to make your program as transparent as possible. It should be very easy for stakeholders, partners, and your citizens to see everything that you have going on with each of your various programs and activities. And you need to try to keep your program in the public eye. Don't try to hide things, even the bad things. Um, you know, bad news doesn't get better with age. The best way that you can be as transparent is by using the website that you're required to have when you manage these. Make sure that you're having someone check at minimum weekly that the information on there is accurate and that you haven't had some sort of technical issue that's wiped documents out because I can assure you that your HUD rep periodically is checking your website and they will let you know if there are problems. So you, you'd rather find it yourself than let HUD tell you about it. Next slide, please. So the key to a successful program is having in place a lot of checks and balances. You wanna make sure that you have um, quality control built throughout your program and you want to ensure that you're not only looking at your contractors, but looking at your internal staff. So whenever you're doing QAQC, don't assume that just because someone that works for you is the one who's handling that task, you need to, you need to check and verify that you're, you're getting what you're paying for, whether that's internally or externally. Next slide. So there are five critical capabilities that you have to have to have a successful program. That's gonna be compliance and monitoring, finance, audit, and legal. And you want to build these teams 
now. Don't be cheap when you're trying to put together these teams. Don't try to, you know, understaff it and just get by because you will pay for it later with findings and concerns from HUD. Next slide. And the key is not letting them operate in silos. Um, you want to integrate all of those critical capabilities into your planning and daily operations. Have them all take a look at your entire process flow. Have them inspect files while they're moving through that process flow, not just at the end. That way you can correct issues when you, you know, before you're at the, the end state. These critical capabilities need to know and understand what's going on in, within your program and have them help establish those program standards because then you'll have more buy-in. They'll understand why decisions were made, why the program is designed as it is, and that'll help to avoid confusion down the road. Next slide. So there are some keys to communicating with all these critical capabilities. Co-location is very important. If everyone is working in the same area, uh, whether that, that building, then it's much easier to have constant communication. Um, there needs to be regular contact between all of your critical capabilities. Once again, they need to be involved in planning. And the best way to ensure communication is to have regularly scheduled meetings, um, whether that's once or twice a week. At minimum, you should have something on the calendar every week where you're getting all these folks in the room so that they can talk through issues. That way you're not surprised when HUD shows up or you're not scrambling to pull everything together once you have a monitoring visit scheduled. Next slide. So first we're going to talk about monitoring. Uh, Monitoring is not something that you should do once a year or periodically. It needs to be ongoing uh, with continuous communication and evaluation. You need to have reports and audits and periodic meetings. Your goals should be to prevent deficiencies. So put plans in place to determine compliance and then design corrective actions before HUD or the OIG comes in and tells you to fix it or pay the money back. Next slide. Writing monitoring responsibilities into your contracts is very important. You want to make sure that you have assigned responsibilities to your subrecipients, your contractors, your internal staff for what they're supposed to be looking for and what the standard you expect is. You want to have eyes on early in the process. You need to know more about what's going on in your program and what's happening in the actual field than your contractor does. And you can do this by having dedicated compliance inspectors who have to have, they have to know your program and they need to be, they have strong customer service skills and they can serve as an advocate representing the citizen to the contractor and serving as a bridge between them whenever issues arise. Next slide. HUD is not your enemy. Um, ask questions, ask them to come take a look at your program early um, that way, if you're doing something wrong, they're not going to come three years down the road and say, you got to go back and fix all this. Do yourself a favor by looking at yourself before they show up. Um, use those chapter six checklists that are in that uh, CPD monitoring book. You want to be actively involved whenever HUD shows up. Don't just say, have a look and walk away. Um, be available to answer questions. Have your, all of your experts on standby in the event that they're needed. And you really want to provide easy system of record access to HUD so that um, they can dig around and help you work towards improving your program. Next slide, please. So uh, the difference between auditing and compliance. Auditing is really just looking for fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, compliance is basically measuring how what you said you're going to do translated to what you did in the field. Are, were you in compliance with your action plan? Are you in compliance with all your policies and procedures? You are required to do both auditing and compliance. So you need to have strong auditing and compliance capabilities. Next slide, please. So with compliance, you want to look at yourself. You want to be looking at your contractors, you want to be looking at your subrecipients, and you want to constantly be looking at your program standards. And if something doesn't seem to be working from a program standard standpoint, change it. Um, don't just keep doing it because you thought it was going to work in the beginning and it's not working. So constantly having eyes on what's going on within your activities is critical to ensuring a successful program. Next slide, please. So. With compliance, you're trying to answer three basic questions. Are we following the law? Are we doing what we said we were going to do in our action plan? And are we getting what we paid for at the end of the day? 
from the completed work. Next slide. <clears throat> there are a couple different ways that you can build your compliance team. Um, it needs to be documented in your action plan and implementation plan what your your compliance is going to look like. And don't skimp on you know field inspectors. Hire as many as it takes because at the end of the day, the majority of the work that they're doing can be treated as an activity delivery cost. So you want to make sure that you're properly documenting on timesheets the time that they spend working on particular cases because you don't need to use administrative dollars to pay for that. And your two options, you can place compliance under one leader uh, within your operation, whether it's a director of operations or construction, or you can have it as a separate entity within your organization. I would encourage you to embed it within uh, because then you end up with more buy-in, you have more control, and at the end of the day, you're working together instead of creating what could potentially be an adversarial relationship with your compliance staff. Next slide. So those compliance officers have to have a particular skill set that um, is a bit diverse. They need to understand your program. They have to have the ability to communicate with both your citizens and your contractors. Um, they need to have the ability to do independent research because odd situations are going to arise in the field. So they need to be able to figure out where to look and how to figure out how to solve problems. Your compliance officers can serve as an interface with your disaster case management staff, uh, helping to ensure constant communication with the program and the citizen. They have to have the ability to use your system of record and you know, take a ton of photos in the field, um, write reports, and then make sure that they are documented in that case file within your system of record. They need to have some common construction knowledge. They don't need to be you know, licensed general contractors, but they need to know what what right looks like, basically, and sometimes they have to be willing to get dirty. Um, they may end up having to crawl into a crawl space, but at the end of the day, their job is basically just to find evidence and then to track progress and help to establish corrective actions early so that you're not trying to fix things at the end. Next slide. So you are required by the federal register to conduct compliance. Um, you need to build that compliance plan into your action plan. And then it's basically just, once again, a measure of, are you doing what you said you're going to do? Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So this is critical. The uh, Having a strong compliance staff will allow you to solve a lot of problems before they come become larger and you end up getting your local politicians involved. So your construction crew and your citizen might have an issue in the field with what's happening at the house, whether they think that something's missing from the scope of work or the work is not done to a proper standard. So you send your compliance officer out there to take a look at it and they can investigate the problem, inspect, um, figure out the contractor's perspective and the citizen's perspective, and then make decisions on the site for the program. So you need to empower them to be decision makers and then ensure that they record those decisions in the system of record. Um, and also have a mechanism in place so that your citizens can appeal the decision that they make. Um, one way to do that is what we used in South Carolina, which was a, a special case panel, which was uh, seven state employees who would review the case once the contractor presented it or the citizen made the request to present it to our constituent services staff. And then they would render a written decision, which would then be recorded in the system of record and reported back to the citizen and the contractor. And that solved, uh, you know, 99% of our problems that couldn't be solved in the field. Next slide, please. These compliance officers need to have, they have to wear many hats. So they deliver and explain your program directives to your citizens. They investigate citizen complaints. They assist with audit investigations. If your audit staff uh, thinks that Ms. Jones uh, may be running a business out of her house and has income that's not being reported, they can go out there and take a look. Um, and they need to participate in the building contractor inspections. I would encourage you to have your compliance staff, if you have enough, to participate in your initial damage assessments. That way they can help to manage expectations for the citizen at the beginning. And they also need to participate in your final inspection process to ensure that you're getting what you paid for, you, you did what you said you were going to do. Next slide, please. So the next critical capability we'll talk about is finance. Um, you need to have a policy for invoicing. Don't make it complicated for your contractors 
to submit the bill to you. Uh, once they submitted that bill to you, you want to make sure that you're paying it in a timely fashion. So keep track of how long it's taking you for your finance staff to process invoices. And when I say process invoice, I'm saying process a proper invoice. So don't let your finance staff uh, become the quality control for your contractors because they want to submit shoddy invoices. Make sure that you have a checklist to ensure that you have all your documents and the system of record prior to paying your bills. Um, your finance staff is really your last line of defense to ensuring that everything is in that system of record. Um, they don't need to verify that everything is correct. They need to make sure that all the documents are there. Your, your, your compliance staff and your audit staff are the ones who need to be checking for accuracy. Your finance staff just needs to be checking to make sure that it is there and include your finance staff as a part of your individual file closeout for that last review to ensure that everything is aligned all the, all the dollars match up and as i mentioned with compliance having your finance staff embedded in the organization will allow for a much smoother process and one way to get in trouble with hud that i want to point out here is that ensure that before you spend a single dollar on a case or before you sign a single contract that you have completed whichever type of environmental is required for the type of project you undertake, whether that's an environmental assessment or a tiered assessment, you wanna make sure you have both that tier one and that tier two in your case file before you pay a dollar or sign a contract. Next slide, please. So you have options for your payment methods. Um, you can just say, I'm gonna pay at the end when the work is complete. Um, you can say, I'm gonna pay 10% once demolition's complete, 50% once the house is roughed in, and then the balance at the end. You're only going to pay 95% at the end and then withhold 5% to allow for a warranty period. Um, but you want to make sure that you establish how you intend to pay in policy and follow that policy. Keeping your program moving financially is critical to success. If you're not paying your contractors in a timely fashion, they're going to pick up and go work somewhere else. There's plenty of opportunities for those contractors throughout the country um, in the DR world. So they're going to go where it works best for them. Make sure that you have rewards and punishment built into your systems. If your contractors are building faster, higher quality work, give them more work. If they're struggling, impose penalties. Um, you can put timeliness standards based on your type of construction. You can say if this rehab project takes more than 60 days for every days after day 60, I'm going to charge $100 a day until you get it done. Because at the end of the day, you want to get that citizen back into the house as quickly as possible. And we always have an obligation to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Next slide. A couple different ways you can build your finance team, but there's really several key missions that they have to be responsible for. First is accounting for all the financial aspects of the grant. Um, they want to be able to conduct a detailed systems check on all invoices prior to payment. They need to be responsible for that DRGR interface and drawing down those grant funds. Um, this is a point where I'll talk about, you know, segregation of duties, make sure you have proper internal controls. Don't have, make sure that you don't have staff doing, you know, requesting payments and then approving payments. You need to make sure you have all that segregated and then everything needs to be recorded in your system of record. Next slide, please. Some simple questions that your finance staff needs to be able to answer. How much money do we have? How much have we spent? How much have we obligated? This should be something that they are reporting to you at minimum on a weekly basis. Um, one area where grantees get in trouble is budgeting administrative cost. So make sure that your finance staff is closely monitoring your admin burn rate and take corrective action if necessary. Don't assume that all of your staff need to be billing their time to admin. Take advantage of activity delivery costs at every opportunity and make sure it's documented properly on your timesheets. Make sure that your finance staff is reviewing those timesheets and then properly allocating the hours worked. Your finance staff needs to know how much money you've provided to subrecipients and what the progress is on their spend. Um, and if you notice that they're struggling, you know, initiate corrective action early so that you're not waiting to the end to pull that money back and then you don't have anywhere else to spend it. And they need to be reporting how much money you're spending on a monthly basis so that you do not end up on the slow spender list because no one wants to be there. Next slide, please. 
Some key metrics that you may wanna have your finance staff report out to you. What's your average cost per home by housing type? Um, what is, how much are we actually spending when we compare the administrative and all of our contractor costs to our direct cost ratio? How long is it taking for us to pay once we have received a proper invoice? What's the general market for paying for a certain service? Um, <clears throat> you need to be reviewing this at minimum on a quarterly basis. You'll find out quickly if you're not paying enough because all your contractors will complain, but you will never find out if you are overpaying. So make sure that you're doing a market analysis to ensure that your rates are in line with what somebody who was reasonable would do in compliance with, you know, cost reasonableness. Next slide, please. Here's an example of a checklist that we used in South Carolina where our finance staff would go in and verify that all of these elements were in the case file before they would pay that final invoice for the case. Uh, because once you've paid it out, you're likely not gonna have much assistance from that contractor in putting any documents that might be missing, such as permits um, or the green building checklist. Next slide, please. So let's talk a bit more on program payment options. Um, when we talk about seed money, this is an area where you can really help a lot of your local builders participate if you're able to provide some money up front so that they're not having to serve as the bank for your program. Um, you can provide it as a percentage, as I mentioned earlier, you can say we're going to give $10,000 at the beginning so that you can go out and buy building materials and you're not having to float, you know, $100,000 for 90 days. Um, you have to be sure to account for that seed money, though, if you're going to provide it. You don't want to have a situation where you say, I'm going to pay 50% upfront for a mobile home replacement, and then they order the mobile home, but your citizen ends up falling out of the program for whatever reason. So make sure that your finance staff is tracking that seed money and aligning the money sent out with the case files so that you don't end up in a situation where you're trying to claw back several hundred thousand dollars from a contractor when you realize that. 20 or 30 of the applicants ended up not moving through your process. And make sure that you document how you intend to provide seed money in all of your policies and procedures. Next slide, please. So you want to invoice for work that's completed. You want to make sure that it's an accurate representation of the scope of work and all associated change orders. It needs to be validated in your system of record. Uh, make sure that you're accounting for previous payments if you are providing that seed money. And fast cash makes fast friends. So make sure that your staff is processing those invoices as quickly as possible and not wasting their time fixing bad invoices for your contractors. If they find errors, kick it back. That way they're able to process quickly valid invoices. Next slide, please. You have four different options for invoicing. Option one is where your subcontractor will then submit an invoice to your general contractor who will submit it to your subrecipient, who will then submit it to you as the grantee and you'll pay your subrecipient. Option two, you may have a subcontractor submit an invoice directly to you as the grantee. Option three, you work directly with the general contractor who then works with the subcontractors. And then option four is you have some organization in between that's an implementation vendor who all invoices flow through the implementation vendor and you're paying one entity. Um, I would encourage you to use option four because it allows you to have, <coughs> excuse me, less procurement opportunities built within your program, which allows you to assign houses rather than putting everything out to bid, which is gonna really expedite your progress uh, for your, your programs. Next slide, please. So you wanna have system checks in place prior to making your payments. You need to have that documented disaster damage. You need to make sure that your citizen met all of your eligibility requirements. You need to make sure that all of the work orders and associated change orders are proper and make sure that you're you know, checking that you're being billed at the rates that you established, whether you used a fixed price or if you use some sort of third party software like Xactomy. You wanna make sure that you have documented with photos, evidence of completed work, and it is uploaded in your system of record. All of this must be in the system of record or it did not happen and you should not pay it. Next slide, please. There's always gonna be a balance between the cost and the speed. Um, it takes forever and a day to just get access to CDBG DR funds. So all of your citizens have likely been in 
dilapidated conditions for probably two years before you even get to them. So you may end up having to pay a bit more to ensure that you're able to build faster. Um, you, there's always going to be a fine line between there. Just make sure it is reasonable and you're checking to ensure that it's reasonable on a quarterly basis. All your contractors are going to expect most likely a 15% profit to 15% overhead on each job. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you want to incentivize and reward good work. If they are building to your standard and they are building fast, give them more homes to build. If they're not, don't give them more homes. Uh, punish your poor performers. Don't keep feeding something that's not working and make sure that you build in standards within your process flow to keep homes moving so that you don't have citizens out for extended periods of time. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, a penalty for, for overstandardness is an effective tool that you is within your capability to use that will ensure that your contractors are doing what they say they're going to do. And keep in mind that your costs are likely going to rise over time. Um, what we've all experienced, particularly with supply and demand issues related to the pandemic, um, stuff ends up costing more. So uh, keep your eye on the marketplace and make sure that you're paying competitively so that those contractors don't go work somewhere else. Next slide, please. You need to write incentivized contracts. Don't pay for effort. You only want to be paying for outcomes. So, you know, if you're paying an implementation vendor, say, I'll pay you X amount when you complete 100 homes. I'll pay you X amount when you complete 500 homes. I'll pay you X amount when the warranty period ends. Don't say, I'm going to pay you to do damage assessments. I'm going to pay you to do environmental reviews. Uh, make sure you're paying for the final product. That way, you're not wasting money. Use time to incentivize them. You can put... Uh, you can say, if you get me 100 homes complete by this date, then I'll pay you this much more. If it takes you another month beyond that, that amount's going to lower. If it takes you three months beyond that, we're going to lower it even more. But make sure that your standards are measurable, transparent, and they are built into your contracts. Next slide, please. So, you need to have an established payment system, and all your staff needs to know how that system needs to operate, what that process flow looks like, what the what the checks and balances are. <clears throat> and the, the person who does the work is responsible for a proper invoice. So don't let your finance staff be quality control for your contractors invoices. Make sure that you have a checklist of elements that you verify are in the system of record before you make that payment. And always keep an eye on balancing the speed of recovery with cost reasonableness. Use capitalism to your advantage and be as competitive as you can in the market. And at the end of the day, we all have an obligation to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. Next slide, please. So auditing is the next critical capability that we'll talk about next. It's basically, are we ensuring that we're getting what we're paying for? Um, it's all, all of our processes working. Are we at risk for an OIG finding? Yeah, your audit staff should be independent, but ideally you, they will interface directly with your program. Um, there needs to be some tension in that relationship, but they need to be working towards helping you improve, not working towards, you know, investigating whether Miss Jones had a simple marijuana charge 22 years ago, and now we shouldn't make her eligible for our program. Um, make sure that they're not just, you know, hunting for the sake of hunting, but actually adding value to your program. Next slide, please. Ensure that they're only auditing critical items. Um, you don't want your audit staff, you know, looking at photos for septic system replacements 60% of their time. Um, they need to be looking at every component of your program, looking at you internally, make sure they're environmental, they're auditing your environmental, make sure they're auditing your finance processes, um, have them report to you quarterly at minimum, and that will help to ensure that we are ferreting out any fraud, waste, or abuse that might be lurking in the program. You don't want to have five years down the line. It turns out that your, you know, finance director has embezzled $4 million, and now the state is trying to get that money back, or HUD's trying to get that money back from you. So having your audit staff look at your internal processes, your internal controls, and check your case files will help you to avoid those issues down the line. Next slide, please. So your audit team likely should not report directly to you as the person leading your DR organization. Um, you want them to report to some sort of higher headquarters, whether that's a chief elected official or um, you can use a steering committee model. Um, 
but make sure that you're not letting your audit staff do your compliance work or your compliance work do your audit work, your audit, your compliance staff do your audit work. Um, you got to have both strong auditing and compliance capability to have success. Next slide, please. The key missions of the team, they need to audit eligibility, disaster damage, construction, financial records. They need to be on the lookout for fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, have a hotline available, whether the phone number and an email address, so that people can report suspected fraud, waste, or abuse. They need to be conducting specialized audits and audit your process flows to see what works and what doesn't. Make sure that they record everything that they're looking at in the system of records so that you can show we audited this case file for this reason. This was the finding. Um, your audit staff can assist the program in saving you money at the end of the day. Um, and you want to try to report and track that cost savings. And they need to have free and unfettered access to everything within your system of record, all your financial records, and they need to document what they audit through a report or a note in the particular case file. Next slide, please. So some questions that require auditing. Is the citizen eligible in accordance to our action plan? Is there documentation of that disaster damage? Are we spending money properly in accordance with our action plan? Um, they can audit your duplication of benefits. Make sure that that's being properly accounted for. You can say my audit staff is going to look at every change order over $5,000. Um, they're going to look at 10% of all contractor invoices submitted and all drawdowns that are in the DRGR system, but make sure that you have a plan in place and you dictate to your audit staff what your expectations are for what they should be looking at and how much of it they should be looking at. In addition to any reported claims of fraud, waste or abuse. Next slide, please. So, you do have a requirement with HUD to conduct a single audit um, for if you expend over $750,000 in federal money. Likely in most situations, if your state or territory is dealing with other federal funds, this single audit will likely be completed in a more comprehensive fashion. So you may just have to report data to that process, but you need to check and make sure that you do have a single audit every year because um, it's one way that you can quickly get in trouble. Next slide, please. <clears throat> you need to make sure that you're advising your subrecipients of their requirements to conduct a single audit if you're going to be providing more than $750,000 to them. And make sure that you document in your contracts that requirement to them. Next slide, please. So, you need to have internal audit, you need to have an independent audit. Uh, you need to make sure that you're doing any of your required state audits and make sure that you have that single audit completed every year. Next slide, please. Your audit staff can help you out with eligibility issues um, by reviewing your process flow, reviewing cases as they move through that process flow, and making sure that you're not serving ineligible citizens. So let them have the ability to put a case on hold if they have concerns about it, but make sure that that case doesn't just get lost in limbo. So you need to have some sort of meeting established where your audit staff reports to you every case that they put on hold and what their progress is on that so that you can work to a resolution, whether that's they move through the process flow or they're determined to be ineligible. Next slide. So here's what that audit hold process flow should look like. They find a discrepancy, they put it on hold, um, they do their investigation, and then they turn it over to you as the person implementing the program to make a decision on whether or not they are eligible. And then they either move forward or they're removed from the program. You should really try to not have a citizen on audit hold for longer than 21 days. Um, if you're not careful, you'll have a situation where your audit staff gets a little overzealous and they'll put a ton of cases on audit hold and then you'll have folks sitting in limbo for two, three, four, five, six months at a time, which is going to lead to a lot of complaints and uh, ultimately going to make your program look bad. Next slide, please. So here are some suggested threshold options with single family housing. Um, it's generally considered to be high risk. So you want to make sure that you're auditing about a quarter of all your files um, for the most part. And then, but you really want to make sure that you have the capability to document what's being audited within that system of record and ensure that your audit staff is building a standardized report that gets reported to whoever's in charge 
at the higher headquarters level, whether that's a governor or a, a mayor or some sort of steering committee, make sure that they are providing a report to them on a quarterly basis. Next slide, please. So just like all the other critical capabilities, your auditors have to know your action plan and your policies. They need to know your program. Um, make sure that they're auditing those items with the highest cost benefit. You don't want them, you know, messing around with, you know, $100, $200 issues. They need to be focused on $1,000, $10,000, you know, $50,000 issues. Uh, make sure that they are auditing your subrecipients. Audit your eligibility as much as you can. And if you if you think there's a concern about documentation, whether it's a, you know, this driver's license might be fraudulent or we think they weren't actually living there at the time of the disaster, then put that case on hold and give your audit staff time to investigate. And you want to make it as easy as possible when HUD shows up for them to see what you audited yourself. So documenting properly in your system of record and having those quarterly reports um, will help you out once HUD comes into town. Next slide, please. So the last of the critical capabilities that we'll talk about is legal. Um, <clears throat> having a robust legal department is very important for ensuring that you're following the law, that you are in compliance with all those federal cross-cutting requirements. You're meeting the what's dictated in the Federal Register Notice. Um, but you want your legal staff to be embedded in your process and then provide guidance as you develop your policies and procedures, but do not let your legal department write your policies and procedures. You need to have them written to a standard that is simple to understand. Um, you don't need to have a bunch of legal jargon thrown in there. They just need to make sure that what you said you're going to do is legal. Um, and in some jurisdictions, you may be required to have legal staff involved in real estate transactions. I know that was the case for us in South Carolina. Your legal staff can assist you in writing those decision memos for situations that you had your compliance staff as arbit arbitrators and it ended up making its way up to a special case panel. Um, they need to help you in contract development. They don't need to write the contract. You as the operator should write the contract and they should review the contract to make sure that it is legal. Um, they are critical for your procurement process and ensuring that you are in compliance with procurement requirements. Next slide, please. So your lawyer is going to be the best person to help you understand all of the, the myriad of laws that you're required to follow. The best thing that you can have to counter a lawyer is a lawyer. So don't be afraid. Don't design your program to be so risk adverse because you're afraid somebody's going to sue you. Just have a good lawyer. You're going to get sued at some point through this process. Um, but having a strong legal staff will allow you to operate more efficiently. Let them assist you in writing policy, but they need to be, you know, a part of the process, but not the primary author. <clears throat> and one key thing that legal can do is help you work through issues that may come up with heirs properties. Um, so in South Carolina in particular, we ran into a lot of situations where, you know, this land has been passed down from generation to generation, and there wasn't a whole lot of documentation with the county courthouse on that. So having a strong legal staff can help you work through those issues so that you're able to help your most vulnerable citizens at the end of the day. Next slide, please. So you want to make sure that the people you hire for all these critical capabilities are OCD. Uh, they need to be the absolute best at paying attention to details. Um, it, they're going to be a pain in your butt, but it's going to be worth it at the end of the day. Uh, these programs are very, very long. You need to plan for transition. Uh, make sure you have documented processes in place for, you know, what each area's responsibility is. That way, if somebody leaves, you can have somebody plug right back in and you don't end up with a loss of service. You need to be over communicating. Um, you do not want to have these critical capabilities siloed or compartmentalized. You don't want to keep things a secret. Everything needs to be transparent. Um, you cannot communicate enough. Over communicate, over communicate, over communicate. These are the key players who are going to be involved in closing out your program at the end of the day. So they're going to help you to ensure that all of your case files are as clean as possible so that you can have a clean transition to grant closeout. Next slide, please. So when HUD comes in, um, don't be afraid. You want to seek out HUD inspections. They're going to look at your program and they're going to help you to make 
corrections before the OIG comes in five years later and then you end up having to pay, pay a bunch of money out. Um, you need to have a plan in place for these HUD monitoring visits. Um, make sure that you're scheduling your own pre-inspections, work through those checklists, um, which you can find in the CPD monitoring handbook. Um, do the checklist before they get there. When they're actually on site for an inspection, work with them. Um, help work towards a yes. You're, they're gonna run into problems. Um, they're, they're gonna be concerns, but if you're actively engaged in the monitoring process, oftentimes you'll have an opportunity to make corrections to your policies while HUD is still there. And that way, once they leave, they're not writing a report that says we have 22 findings because you can address 21 of them before they even leave your facility. Next slide, please. We will now open it up for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Joe. I'm not currently seeing any questions that have come in the Q and A or the chat box. Um, so if anyone has questions, go ahead and type them now. Um, otherwise, we will move on. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. I'll pass it on to you, Jr. Thanks so much. Um, you know the the whole theory behind this block of instruction is that, you know, in the DR world, we need to find problems before they find us. And I think Joe did a masterful job here of laying out where we can find all those problems at. Because what happens is if we don't find it as a problem, we will find it later on as a crisis. Um, and when that happens, um, a lot of people get involved. Uh, if you'd like to come and geek out with us, uh, we talk disaster recovery uh, with you and your peers, and you learn just as much from your peers as you will from our great cadre. We'll do that again in January in Savannah. Uh, your your eyeballs will roll back in your head, but if you're a disaster nerd like the rest of us, you will have a blast. So we talk disaster recovery from the CDBGDR perspective, uh, soup to nuts. Uh, we believe that we are impacting programs across the nation. And if you're interested, uh, let us know, talk to your bosses, see if you'd like to come. We'd love to have you, love to meet you and love to talk to you and love to learn from you because every disaster is unique and every disaster is different. Next chart, please. Uh, once again, uh, for those finance folks, Joe covered a great deal of detail in here uh, today about all things associated with finance and what a critical capability that was for leaders. But if you're a finance leader in this business, uh, you, you know, we need to be now be talking about DRGR. We need to be talking about drawdowns. We need to be talking about checklists. And we teach all that in this course, and we'll do this January 6th through the 8th uh, in Savannah. Uh, we are having to charge for this course, uh, but we think that you will, your finance leaders and the folks in your finance department will learn a tremendous amount by it uh, and make you better. So with that, uh, we ask that you uh, consider us for this. Next chart, please. Again, the list of uh, webinars that we have, uh, we're going to continue on until uh, Walmart, uh, until the Mar Walmart Foundation grant runs out. So we're going to continue to teach uh, about one or two uh, webinars per month. Uh, we think these are good for the disaster recovery industry. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments, or uh, we always send out all of our charts under our share initiative, we send you everything that we do. So we hope this is helping you. If it is, give us some feedback. Let's go to the next chart. And finally, we'd like to say, join us on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is uh, is our professional network, and we ask that you would, uh, would join us with that. And I think that's my last chart. And Olivia, I pass back to you. Great. We did have one question come in actually. Um, should compliance and monitoring be separate departments entirely? They can be, they don't have to be. Um, it really, I think it really depends on the size of your grant. If you have uh, a tremendous number of programs and need a lot of staff, you might want to consider having them as two separate functions just because it'll make it a little easier to manage. Um, but there's no reason why they have to be separate. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, so with that, I'm just going to say thank you everyone for joining us today on behalf of SBP and the Walmart Foundation. And please reach out if you have any questions or if you're interested in joining us at LPC or our finance leader course. And I will be sending out the slides from today, so look out for that in your inbox. All right, and with that, um, we will close here. Thank you everyone.